Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara. And we are reading Charles Dickens A Christmas Carol. We'll get right to that. It held up its chain at arm's length, as if that were the cause of all its unveiling grief, and flung it heavily upon the ground floor. At this time of the rolling year, the specter said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down, and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very dismayed to hear the specter going on at this rate, and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, cried the ghost, my time is nearly gone. I will, said Scrooge, but don't be hard upon me, don't be flowery, Jacob, pray. How is it that I peer before you in a shape that you can see? I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. It was not an agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the perspiration from his brow. That is no light part of my penance, pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. You are always a good friend to me, said Scrooge. Thank ye. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghost's had done. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is. I, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visit, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I dread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Hinted Scrooge. Expect the second on the night at next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when this last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more. And look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the specter took its wrapper from the table and bound its head as before. Scrooge knew this. By the smart sound its teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude, with its chain wound about, over and above its arm. The apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped, not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear. For in the raising of the hand, he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret. Wailings, inexpressible sorrow, and self accusatory. The specter, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window. Desperate in his curiosity, he looked out. The air was filled with phantoms wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle. He cried piteously at being unable to assist the wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and lost the power forever. 
Whether these creatures faded into mist or, e or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was a double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were just undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first symbol, syllable. And being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant. Stave to the first of the three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavoring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes. When the chimes of a neighboring church struck the four quarters, so he listened for the hour. To his great astonishment, the heavy bell went on from six to seven, and from seven to eight, and regularly up to twelve, and then stopped. Twelve, it was past two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong. An icicle must have gone, gotten to the works. Twelve? He touched the spring of his repeater to correct his most preposterous clock. His rapid little pulse beat twelve and stopped. Why, it is impossible, said Scrooge that I can have slept through a whole day and far into another night. <clears throat> it is impossible that anything has happened to the sun, and this is twelve at noon. The idea being an alarming one, he scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. He was obliged to rub the frost off with the sleeve of his dressing gown before he could see anything and could see very little then. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold and that there was no noise of people running to and fro and making a great stir, as there unquestionably would have been if night had beaten up bright day and taken possession of the world. This was a great relief, because three days after sight of this first of exchange, paid to Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge, or his order and so forth, would have become a mere United States security if there were no days to count by. Scrooge went to bed again and thought and thought and thought it over and over and could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was, and the more he endeavored not to think, the more he thought. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. Every time he resolved within himself, after mature inquiry, that it was all a dream, his mind flew back again, like a strong spring released to his first position, and presented the same problem to be worked all through. Was it a dream or not? Scrooge lay in the state until the chime had gone three quarters more, when he remembered on a sudden that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell tolled. He resolved to lie awake until the hour was past, and considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven, this was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. The quarter was so long that he was more than once convinced he must have sunk into a doze unconsciously and missed the clock at last at length it broke upon his listening ear ding dong a quarter past said scrooge counting ding dong half past said scrooge ding dong a quarter to it said scrooge ding dong the hour itself said scrooge triumphantly and nothing else he spoke before the hour bell sounded which it now did with a deep dull hollow melancholy one light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand, not the curtains at his feet, nor the curtains at his back, but those to which his face was addressed. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, stare, starting up into a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them as close to it as I am now to you, and I am standing in the spirit at your elbow. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view. Being diminished to a child's proportions, 
Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it. And the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands the same, as if it hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet, most delicately formed, were like those upper members bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist were, was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was, that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light, by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using, in its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap, which is it now held under its arm. Even this, though, when Scrooge looked at it with increasing steadiness, was not its strangest quality. For as it had its belt sparkled and glittered, now in one part and now in another, and what was light one instant and another time was dark, so the figure itself fluctuated in its distinctness, being now a thing with one arm, now with one leg, now with twenty legs, now a pair of legs without a head, now a head without a body, which dissolve in part, no outline would be visible in the dense gloom wherein they melted away. And in the very wonder of this, it would be itself again, distinct and clear as ever. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? asked Scrooge. I am. The voice was soft and gentle, singularly low, as if instead of being so close beside him, it were at a distance. Who and what are you? Scrooge demanded. I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? inquired Scrooge. Observant of its dwarfish stature? No, your past. Perhaps Scrooge could not have told anybody why anybody could have asked him, but he had a special desire to see the spirit in his cap and begged him to be covered. What, exclaimed the ghost, would you so soon put out with worldly hands the light I give? Is it not enough that you are one of those whose passions made this cap? and forced me through whole trains of years to wear it low upon my brow. Scrooge reverently disclaimed all intentions to offend, or any knowledge of having willfully bonneted the spirit at any period of his life. He then made bold to inquire what business brought him here, there. Your welfare, said the ghost. Scrooge expressed himself much obliged, but could not help thinking that a night of unbroken rest would have been more conductive to the end. The spirit must have heard him thinking, for it said immediately, Your reclamation, then, take heed. <coughs> it put out its strong hand as it spoke and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes, that bed was warm and the thermometer a long way below freezing, that he was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap, and that he had a cold upon him at that time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made towards the window, clasped his robe in supplication, I am immortal. Scrooge remonstrated, liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand, dear, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road, with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it for it was a clear, cold winter day, with snow upon the ground. Good heaven, said Scrooge, clasping his hands together as he looked about him. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. The spirit gazed upon him mildly, its gentle touch, though it had been lightened and con instantaneous, appeared still present to the old man's sense of feeling. He was conscious of a thousand odors floating in the air, each one con Connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and cares long, long forgotten. 
Your lip is trembling, said the ghost. And what is that upon your cheek? Scrooge muttered with an unusual catching in his voice that it was a pimple and begged the ghost to lead him where he would. You recollect the way, inquired the spirit. Remember it, cried Scrooge of Fervor. I can walk it blindfolded. Strange, I've forgotten it for so many years, observed the ghost. Let us go on. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree, till a little market town appeared in the distance, with its bridge, its church, and winding river. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs, who called to other boys in country gigs and carts, driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits, and shouted to each other, and the broad fields were so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They have no consciousness of us. The joke on travelers came on, and as they came, Scrooge knew and named every them, named them every one. Why was he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them? Why did his cold eyes glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with a gladness when he heard them? Give each other Merry Christmas as they parted at crossroads and byways for their several homes. What, what was Merry Christmas to Scrooge out upon Merry Christmas? What good had it ever done to him? The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Scrooge said he knew it, and he sobbed. They left the high road by a well-remembered lane, and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick, with a little weather cock surmounted cupola on the roof, and a bell hanging on it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes, for the spacious offices were little used. Their walls were damp and mossy. Their windows broken and their gates decayed. Fowls clucked and strutted in the stables, and the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. Nor was it more retentive of its ancient state within, for entering the dreary hall and glancing through the open doors of many rooms, they found them poorly furnished, cold and vast. There was an earthy savor in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight, and not too much to eat. They went the ghost and Scrooge across the hall to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made st bare still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. And one of these, a lonely boy, was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down upon a form, and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be. Not a latent echo in the house, not a squeak and scuffle from the mice behind the paneling, not a drip from the half-thawed water spout in the dull yard behind, not a sigh among the leafless boughs of one despondent poplar, not the idle swinging of an empty storehouse door, no, not a clicking in the fire, but fell upon the heart of Scrooge with a softening influence and gave a freer passage to his tears. The spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to his younger self, intent upon his reading. Suddenly a man in foreign garments, wonderfully real and distinct to look at, stood outside the window with an axe stuck in his belt and leading by the bridle in an ass led with, leaden with wood. Why, it's Ali Baba! Scrooge exclaimed in ecstasy, dear old, Al dear old honest Ali Baba. Yes, yes, I know. One Christmas time, when yonder solitary child was left here all alone, he did come for the first time just like that. Poor boy. And Valentine, said Scrooge, his wild brother Orson. There they go. And what's his name? Who was put down in his drawers asleep at the gate of Damascus? Don't you see him? And the Sultan's groom turned upside down by down by the genie. There he is upon his head. Serve him right, I'm glad of it. What business had he to be married to the princess? Dear Scrooge, spending all the earnestness of his nature on such subjects in a most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying and to see his heightened and excited face would have been a surprise to his business friends in the city indeed. There's the parrot, cried Scrooge, green body and yellow tail. 
with a thing like a lettuce growing out of the top of his head. There he is, poor Robinson Crusoe, he called him, when he came home again after sailing around the island. Poor Robinson Crusoe. Where have you been, Robinson Crusoe? The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. It was the parrot, you know. There goes Friday, running for his life to the little creek. Hello, whoop, hello. Then with the rapidity of transition, very foreign to his usual character, he said in a pity for his former self, poor boy, and cried again. I wish, Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket and looking upon him after drying his eyes with his cuff. But it's too late now. What is the matter, asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge, nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something, that's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved his hand, saying, as it did so, let's see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell over the ceiling. The naked laths were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. He only knew that it was quite correct, that everything had happened so, that there he was alone again when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost, and with a mournful shaking of his head, glanced anxiously toward the door. It opened. And little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in and putting her arms about his neck and often kissing him and dressing him as her dear, dear brother. I have come to bring you home, dear brother, said the child, clapping her tiny hands and bending down to laugh, to bring you home, home, home. Home, little fan, returned the boy. Yes, said the child, brimple up the lee. Home for good and all, home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be, that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one night that when I was going to bed, that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you were to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes, and never to come back here. But first, we are to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. You are quite a woman, little fan, exclaimed the boy. She clasped her hands and laughed and tried to touch his head, but being too little, laughed again and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him in her childish eagerness towards the door, and he, nothing, loth to go, accompanied her. A terrible voice in the hall cried, Bring down Master Scrooge's box there. In the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, leered on Master Scrooge with a ferocious condensation, condescension, excuse me, and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands with him. He then conveyed him and his sister into the various old well of a shivering best parlor that ever was seen, with the maps upon the wall and the celestial and terrestrial globes in the windows were waxy with cold. Here he produced a decanter of curiously light wine and a block of curiously heavy cake and administered installments of those dainties to the young people at the same time sending out a meager servant to offer a glass of something to the postboy who answered that he thanked the gentleman but if he it was the same tap as he had tasted before he had rather not master scrooge's trunk being by this time tied onto the top of the chase the children bade the schoolmaster goodbye right willingly, and getting into it, drove gaily down the garden sweep, the quick wheels dashing the hoarfrost and snow from off the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray. Always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered, said the ghost, but she had a large heart. So she had, cried Scrooge, you're right, I will not gainsay it, spirit, God forbid. She died a woman, said the ghost, and had, as I think, children, one child. Scrooge returned. True, said the ghost, your nephew. Scrooge seemed uneasy in his mind and answered briefly, yes. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and stay tuned for more, for more of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol.